So I'm going to get started with our introductions. We are recording the evening and it will appear on our website as well. So if anybody has to come and go um, and misses any part of it, you can catch up with us. So hi, welcome uh, to the Judith and Norman Alex Art Gallery's Summer Art and Idea Series. My name is Sonia Blazek and I'm the curator at the gallery. And this evening I have the pleasure of introducing artist Lee Henderson. Uh, Lee is one of the artists currently exhibiting at the gallery. His exhibition is titled An Abridged Sonic History of Global Conflict, Conflict, and it will open to the public in August. Until we're able to welcome you into the physical exhibition, I'd like to encourage you to visit us virtually. You can do this by going to the gallery website, jnag.ca, and navigating to the virtual exhibitions tab. The gallery is also producing a publication for the exhibition, which will be available in the coming months. I'd like to take a quick moment to thank Jen Hutton and Ted Barris for contributing essays to the publication. Ted's knowledge of military history mixed with personal experience in the, with bands created a brilliant response to Lee's exhibition by touching on the history of military song in his essay titled Music and Military in Lockstep. Jen's essay titled The Tomb in Reverse offers a meditation on what a band is and the posturing that plays into naming a band. Thank you both so much. Now I have the great opportunity to introduce Lee Henderson. Lee is a contemporary artist whose practice includes video, photography, installation, sculpture, performance, and text. He's based in Toronto, where he currently teaches art and media at the university formerly known as Ryerson and OCAD University. He studied art in Canada and Germany and received a BFA from the Alberta College of Art and Design and an MFA from the University of Regina. He has exhibited across Canada, as well as Los Angeles, Washington, Chicago, Naples, and Berlin. Uh, I'd like to invite our guests to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens to submit any questions. You can also chat into our um, chat box there. If you have questions that come up during the conversation, please go ahead and populate them into the Q&A box and then we will answer as many of them as we can at the conclusion at the talk. Um, Lee, it's been an absolute joy working with you. Thank you for your resilience through the pandemic uh, and the comic relief through the countless emails that you had to wade through. Um, and foremost, thank you for allowing us to bring this body of work to the gallery. You've been generous with sharing your brilliant mind with our volunteers and staff already. And I'm so pleased we had the good fortune of hosting you on site for installation. Uh, thank you for being back with us tonight. I am looking forward to where this evening takes us. Thanks, Sonia. Uh, so am I. It's, uh, it was a, a treat to be able to come out there and install in person um, and see Sarnia and hang out a little bit. Um, the staff at the Alex is kind of great, so I'm really glad I got to meet you guys in person. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to dive in one little thing first, though, maybe, Sonia, if I can ask a favor. Um, if there are any questions that come up that are sort of like, that feel kind of immediate or pressing or that they should be responded to like right away. Um, I won't be able to see them on the chat if I'm screen sharing. So feel free to just like go on mic and ask or whatever. I'm not, there's no like, there's like a structure, but there's not really a structure. So um, yeah, feel free to, feel free to interrupt me. Um, and then if people will bear with me for two seconds, I'm just going to switch over to screen sharing and to my, uh, presentation thing. So hopefully that worked and you should be all be able to see the screen, which is just a gray kind of field at this point, I think. Um, okay, great. So uh, when I was doing my MFA years and years ago, I was tasked with, as artists often are, with kind of categorizing what I saw as the focus of my work um, or the consistent thread throughout it. And I was making a lot of work about death and sort of the contemplation of death and meditative approaches to it and contemplative spaces built kind of around it or spaces for the contemplation of it. And I, and part of that comes from seeing the gallery as a kind of um, a secular space for contemplation, I suppose. In some ways it replaces the, um, the liturgical hall. Um, but in a, in a secular context. 
And I think it's, it's tempting to relegate those spaces to a kind of purely intellectual experience. Um, it's a pressure that exists, I think, for a lot of artists, um, certainly any who have overlap with academic institutions, to um, frame their practice in those terms. And that's not good or bad. It's just a thing. Um, it's fine as long as it's not the only thing. But the phrase that I sort of managed to cobble together to describe what I more or less exist in orbit of is the persistence of collective histories and the brevity of individual lives. So although a lot of my work at the time was focused on death and kind of death in the sense of the individual's inevitable non-being, um, I also was considering it more broadly and thinking about, well, you know, but there are also other forms of death or mortality more broadly, like, you know, a building getting torn down or um, a language not being spoken anymore or a film stock becoming obsolete. So I was thinking about, and I continue to think about, the ways that bits of our collective experiences get co sort of like locked off and we say, okay, that thing has ended, it's over, it, it's hit its uh, terminal point. Okay. So tonight, I, given the show that's up at the Judith and Norman Alex Art Gallery, I thought I would sort of retroactively trace some overlaps in my practice between mass culture and mortality. You could call it the, uh, the mortality of images, if you like, the mortality of sounds, maybe. And I'm going to look at about uh, just some samples from about 10 years of work uh, around this theme. So this is a work called Refinement Pavilion Number 1. And I've done a series of these. Uh, this one is subtitled Nabokov, Vladimir, the original of Laura, Dying is Fun, PS 3527.A1507520009. And this grew out of a, th a news story in 2009 about how Nabokov had written part of a novel. He'd written like, he was on his way to writing a novel. He had written down fragments of the novel on um, cue cards, on like recipe cards. And then he died. And in his will, his instruction was, because this is unfinished, it should be burned, destroyed, unread. No one should ever get to read it. I don't want it to exist. Do that. Uh, his family didn't do that. They put his note cards into a safe deposit box in Switzerland. And every like five or 10 years, his son would sort of like float the idea of maybe I will release uh, my father's unfinished novel or manuscript, and then everyone would sort of get upset, and Nabokov scholars would say, how can you do that? This, like, it's clearly not his wish, and so on. And then eventually in, yeah, 2009, he, um, he did that. He took the note cards out of the safe deposit box in Switzerland, m put them in book form, and released it as a book. So you, this is a book that you can go out and buy now. And it seemed to me that, like, the sort of, um, there was a kind of ambiguity or an ambivalence that the scholarly community had to this, where some of them were thinking, like, well, great, you know, we have this new work by our favorite author that we can study. And the others were saying, well, this is, but the author's wishes were that it never be read. And so, can you even call it a Nabokov if he said it wasn't a finished work of his, if he said it wasn't a complete work and that it should be destroyed? So, I figured somebody at least should do what he said. So I bought a first edition, first printing of the book, which was easy because it was released in 2009. And I burned it um, down to ash, down to white ash, and placed it into a funerary urn. And I started doing this for other works as well, so that at least one person would have done what the author wanted. Um, this is Franz Kafka's The Trial, uh, PZ3.K11TR. And the sort of code at the end of the subtitle is the Library of Congress call number for that book. Um, so this, again, first edition, first printing book that I tracked down of Franz Kafka's The Trial, and then I burned it down to ash, sealed it in an urn. Part of, the, part of my agreement, my posthumous agreement with the authors, is that I will never read these books. So I've never read the original of Laura. I've never read... Uh, Franz Kafka's The Trial. I basically steer clear of all Emily Dickinson on the off chance that any of those poems were in her first collection of poems, which she didn't want read and she wanted burned. Um, so that at least somebody will have done what the author wanted and honored their wishes. 
And so I have to choose an urn based on what I assume about the book. Um, so I chose a kind of Grecian shaped one for the trial. It seems a little bit bureaucratic, a little bit chilly, which, you know, from the ether I've just gathered is uh, kind of the theme of the, the work. Uh, several years later, this is a work called Palliative Care, 1985 to 1992. And uh, I grew up watching the Golden Girls at my grandma's house when I was a little kid. And I've, I was thinking about the fact that um, I'm quite comfortable with conversations around death and the idea of inevitability in death. And that maybe that's not weird, but people seem to respond to it as though it's weird. So I was thinking about where does that come from? And I, I think a lot of it comes from uh, my grandma and the sort of sense of humor that she had around her own inevitable mortality, around just sort of death in general. And part of it also was watching the Golden Girls with her. Um, there are a lot of morbid jokes in the Golden Girls. So I went through and I made a, um, I went through the whole series and made a supercut where I just pulled all of the references to death from the whole series. The final work is about 25 minutes long, uh, which is a nice happy accident. It's about the length of an episode. And I made a set of rules for myself about which references I would allow and which ones I wouldn't allow. If, um, if Blanche, for example, says heart attack because she's referring to her brother who's in ill health, that counts. If she says heart attack in reference to, um, you know, um, a gentleman caller was especially handsome and he almost gave me a heart attack, that doesn't count because she's clearly not actually talking about death. So I would sort of like make my choices uh, contextually. And I would also hold until another word or reference came or a cut or another line. So sometimes that means I hold on the uh, laugh track. If the word dead comes as the punchline of a joke, then I hold the laugh track. Or, well, maybe it was, an, maybe it was a live audience. I don't recall. Um, so you hear laughter at, that sort of punctuates this. Uh, and it kind of breaks up the staccato rhythm of it. I'm just going to play some excerpts from that. It, uh, I turned it into an installation. This is an artist multiple version that you're seeing on the screen right now. So it's a DVD of that 25-minute that video a little booklet that just catalogs all of the references uh, textually. Uh, and then, of course, they are in a pine box. Uh, OK, so this is from when it was installed at Latitude 53 in Edmonton in 2016. And I, um, I install it in the space, as you'll see in a sec, with four chaise longue. So it's this kind of, but they're not really Floridian chaise longue. They're like slabs a little bit. So I like the idea that you can kind of like recline, you know, a little bit corpse-like as you watch this video that's elevated and tilted. Uh, so it kind of looms over you. Um, and we also, it was in um, August in Edmonton, but we turned the heat up in the gallery so it would feel like really Floridian in there. This will just take a sec to start up. Kill, kill, heart attack. Dead. Died, died. Died funeral. Murder. Dead. Dead. Murdered. <laughs> funeral. Funeral caskets, burial, dead, morbid deaths, service, funeral. Funeral. Condolences. Pass on. Killed a funeral. Crypt, casket, burying, bereaved, pine box, services. Hell died the funeral. Funeral. Funeral is cremated. Urn, spirit, expiration, spirits, prospects. <laughs> Funeral. Greek kill, 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 dead. Killing. Die. Pull the plug. <laughs> Pass. Pay my respects. Bones bury a dead. Stab and stab and kill. And shoot bones. Remains beyond grave. Dead. Die. Funeral. Kill. Died. Dying. Died. Murder. Suicide. Die. Fatal. Dead. Kill. Killing. Pull the plug. Die. Haunt. Kill. Die. Dead. Died. <laughs> 
died. Morning, Deb. Estate. Doom. Died. Funeral. Funeral? Did the will executor or will beneficiary? Died. Lately. The latest member. <laughs> Cut. Killed, killed. Murderers. Murdered. Patricide. Murder. Killed. Murder. Sacrificial knife. Murder. Slash from left to right. Murder. Murderer. Murders his will. Inheritor. Dead. Dead. No breath. Huh? Dead. Huh. Dead through the heart. So that's just a short excerpt, but you get the idea. Um. Oh. How does it? Jump forward. Sorry, one sec. There we go. Uh, so in that same year, um, I was working with a found slide archive that I had found at a Berlin flea market um, a couple years before. And I had been sort of mulling over like what, what it meant to go through someone else's images and to, to look at their family photos. And it was a family that had lived, that had, I'm assessing this based purely on what was in the images, had lived in Germany probably in Berlin. Um, if they didn't live in Berlin, they like traveled around Berlin a lot. Most of the photos were from the 50s and 60s. So they're in that just sort of like just enough after the war period. And um, at the same time, I was talking to uh, a friend uh, who's also an artist, John Sasaki, who I think I might actually be here. Uh, here. Um, and, and John had a, a slide archive of basically old tourist photos, but they were from a defunct travel agency. So they were kind of, some of them were like the professional photos that the tourist is trying to emulate when they go to Fiji or whatever and start to take their photos. And slides were also the way that you would come to understand the place that you were going to, right? You'd, you'd go to the travel agent and you'd say, well, we're thinking about taking a tropical vacation. And they'd say, they'd pull out the slide projector and go, okay, well, here's Maui and here's Fiji uh, and here's Tahiti um, and I don't know, other places that end in I. So you would have a kind of sense visually of what the place was, but it was this very, it wasn't like the internet, it was this very tightly curated, professionally photographed sense of what those places were for the most part. And then when you're there, you're kind of projecting and you're taking the photograph. You're like, are you really there at the time? Are you present? Or are you taking the photograph thinking about this will be a nice photograph to show to people once I get home? So there's this perpetual kind of tra time traveler uh, disembodiment, I think, that happens when we're uh, tourists taking photographs. And there's a nice, um, spectral oscillation between um, amateur and professional. So I was thinking about that and about the, mort the mortality of images and the materiality of photographs uh, as I was going through these slide collections. So I fused the two archives into essentially one lump archive where the amateur and the professional are intermingled and um, printed them. These were installed in a gallery. Some are framed, some are left just sort of like loose and kind of tentatively hanging on the wall. Uh, and then that was the front room. And then in the back room was the slideshow. Uh, so it's a narrated slideshow. I programmed a little microcontroller to advance the slide at specific times and play audio clips between each advance. So each slide has its own audio clip that the computer just sort of plays along with it as it moves you through this physical, this physical slide carousel. Um, I'm just going to play a little excerpt from that. All photographs are impermanent. It's just that their time scale is different from ours. Their flesh is silver and dye where ours is carbon. Even those archival prints in the front room will shift and fade. It'll take a long time, but they are being diminished constantly, imperceptibly in front of us. That the deterioration is inevitable only makes it seem slower. I'm going to try to show you what I mean. I'm going to advance the carousel in a moment, and I want you to see the elimination of one image and the presentation of the next as a crisis. Let the blackout between slides extend itself inexorably. Let your mind fill it with extra signification and extra time. Spend a little bit of panic for a little extra life. Again. Okay. 
again. Magenta is usually the last color to fade away. I wonder why. Surely there's a pun or a metaphysical joke in here somewhere about photography as a tool of nostalgia. The further into the past things go, the more rose-colored they become. A chain-assisted path goes one-third of the way down the west end of the gorge, next to Devil's Cataract, looking at Final Plunge. APR71A5, Kodachrome Transparency. Um, so that last piece of text that you heard, uh, where I'm reciting uh, numbers and details about the image, that came from the annotation on the slide itself. Uh, so a lot of these slides were annotated either with the type of film that, that was used, the location it was shot, um, maybe the family's own notes about, you know, this is Uncle Franz or whatever. And I, I mean, this is one of those things where like when you go back over your work, you sort of notice tendencies that you have, and they're not necessarily ones that you think about consciously at the time. Um, so it's not totally unlike naming those refinement pavilion works to include the Library of Congress call number uh, in the title. I, I don't know, I haven't fully self-psychoanalyzed that tendency of mine yet, I guess except to say that um, those markings those titular markings place them within or reference the archive from which they uh, arose or the archive from which I gathered them. So be that the Library of Congress or this um, catalog of images. And, and I guess I like nudging towards that index because archives and catalogs and museums and collecting institutions are ways that we kind of try to impose collective survival over individual uh, obsolescence, mortality, and significance. Uh, I think, I don't know, there's something in there. I haven't fully theorized it yet, but I think that's part of why I'm drawn to that strategy. Um, there we go. OK, so uh, the following year, still thinking about uh, mortality and death, um, I was also thinking about um, what transcending that might look like and the ways that we sort of yearn for that in stories and in folk tales. So I was doing a residency at the Glenfiddich Distillery in Scotland. And it's in like this, the distillery is in the small village in the Highlands. And, you know, so it's pretty, it's like, it's pretty, it's pretty folky. And um, I started polling residents for their ghost stories, for like things they've heard about or things, uh, apparitions they had seen or phenomena. I went with the intent of sort of recreating these hauntings digitally, so using projection and sound and things like that. But once I got there, I realized, well, it's far enough north that it's light, except for maybe three hours in the night and in you know the middle of summer. And also that, like, you know, everyone goes home at five. They don't hang around the distillery all night. They go home. So there would be nobody around to see it. So, which, you know, has its own kind of magic, I guess. But uh, so I started investigating these or other techniques, these other modes by which we've tried to, um, you know, import ghosts into visual culture. So I, I got a large format camera and started shooting these double exposure images of cheesecloth and... Uh, so-called haunted locations around the distillery. So this is a, the ruin of Balvini Castle, which is just up the hill from the distillery. Uh, and there's supposedly a, a lady that haunts the, the castle. Um, and so this is an old technique. This is a really old Victorian or pre-Victorian technique of double exposing the same piece of film. So a large format camera uses sheet film, it doesn't use a roll. So you have a big single piece of film that you insert into the camera and then you click the shutter and that exposes um, the plate and then you can pull it out and you can develop it and you get a normal image. Or you can leave it in the camera 
take it someplace else, click the shutter again, it exposes the same piece of film a second time with whatever you've now put in front of it. So if you, say, shoot a photo of Balvenie Castle and then leave the film in the camera and then go back into the studio and hang a piece of cheesecloth in the air with fishing line and put spooky lights on it and a black backdrop and you photograph it again, the only part that gets exposed is where the cheesecloth is. Everything else is black and so it doesn't affect the, uh, the film and it doesn't replace the castle image. So that's what I did. Um, so I did a series of those as, um, as prints. And um, I also was quite taken with how, with the sort of the multiple meanings of the word spirit and how um, there are so many things in a distillery that are labeled spirit something. Spirit is used as a kind of a simultaneous noun and adjective. Um, it's obviously the liquid that's pumping through the things so there are these vats called spirit receivers. Um, but I, I got really interested in the idea of, yeah, okay, well, what if we, but what if we just allow that pun to play out? What if we take them at, at their word that they actually do receive spirits? So um, a distillery, a whiskey distillery, is full of copper piping and like, Spirit and alcohol are moving around all the time through these big copper pipes. And they have to replace the pipes every four years because they'll start at about eight mil thick and then they get worn down to about two mil thick because of the sheer volume of hot alcohol that's getting pumped through them every day. Um, and so they replace them and they take the old ones out and recycle them and they bring new ones in. So I got them to save some of the old ones for me. And uh, so reclaimed those, had them fashioned into vessels, um, which I then filled with my own breath, sealed up, and placed in uh, the spirit safe, which is a sort of, it's a tiny room sort of off the main distillery floor where like alcohol gets pumped through. And it goes through these tiny copper chambers in that room. Um, and so the copper turns pretty quickly to this kind of ver degree. Uh, turquoise color. So I sort of like the idea that these vessels, having sat in the spirit safe and aged for three years in a day, which is the min minimum amount of time to age something to be Scotch whiskey, uh, that they're absor they have they contain spirit in the sense that they literally contain my breath um, before being sealed up. But they also have been infused. Their skins have been infused by the spirit in the atmosphere. Um, one of the other stories that I heard there a lot was that there are ghost coopers. Um, Glenfiddich is uh, relatively rare in that it has its own cooperage. Most distilleries use a kind of single centralized cooperage. Uh, the cooperage is the building where they tear the barrels apart, throw out the broken staves, replace them with good staves, hammer them all back together and put it back into a barrel shape so that it can be used to age whiskey. Because the barrels arrive and they're often like, you know, there will be a, a stave that's not good or, you know, it's, you know, there's some rot in it or it's been damaged in transit or whatever. Um, so the cooperage is where they like take those apart and put them back together. And there's something kind of like, I think beautifully, uh, I don't know, reincarnative about that strategy. I mean, it's sort of like Theseus ship where, you know, is it the same barrel if it's had three staves removed and replaced? Well, what if it's had 20 removed and replaced? What if it's had 30 removed and replaced and only three are left? from the original one. Is it still the same barrel? Um, so I don't know. There's something kind of like nicely embodied about that. Um, but I wanted to replicate uh, this phenomenon that a lot of people complained about where they said, yeah, you know, if you go to the, if you go by the warehouse at midnight, you'll hear the ghost coopers hammering away at barrels when there's nobody there. So I built a robot that sits inside one of these casks and when the temperature or the barometric pressure in the space drops by a certain amount in a short enough time, i.e. it gets a little bit chilly and a little bit spooky, uh, the robot hammers at the side of its cask and so you hear like this hammering um, inside the cask.
That's what it sounds like. Um, and I, after I had finished building that, I realized, oh, this is, you know, I've kind of made, you know, I was hoping for some solidarity with the Coopers and, and kind of making a work that, you know, celebrated their labor. But I, I ended up kind of doing the opposite, where like even in, even in death, their jobs aren't safe from automation. Even their jobs of haunting the warehouse are not safe from robots and automation. So I kind of, um, I don't know, I subverted myself there, I guess. Um, this was uh, another project that I did there called To Conjure From Vapor. And um, this grew out of the sort of sociality of uh, spirits at the distillery. There was, there's an annual party that the sort of brand representatives have every year where they come together from all over the world. They come back to the distillery. They talk about, I don't know, they, they talk about trade craft. They talk about like how they promote whiskey in, in different places and in different ways. And they also talk about how they talk about whiskey because they are often responsible for delivering tasting notes. And so saying like, oh, well, you know, you'll, um, so this will, this will give you Christmas pudding on the nose and then um, there's a smokiness on the palate, but you'll, you'll feel a hint of cherries. And then uh, the aftertaste is, um, is, a little bit like coffee and mint or whatever. And at this party, um, anytime you approach a bottle, you are sort of descended upon by these uh, brand reps who are trying out their stuff on you. It's sort of like, it's like magicians trying out material on you or comedians trying out jokes on you. It's like it's their repertoire, right? And so I was hearing a lot of these tasting notes and thinking about the fact that, well, these tasting notes are like they're helpful and they're great, but they're sort of suggestive. Like if I tell you something that something that's really complex is going to taste like Christmas pudding, you're probably going to think of Christmas pudding. Um, but it also strikes me that these are like they stop. They always stop just short of being philosophical. So they describe a taste with another taste. They describe a smell with another smell. So I started to just sort of jot down my own tasting notes for whiskeys that I was drinking or that I had had before um, along kind of existential or philosophical lines, uh, metaphysical tasting notes, if you like. So I compiled these into a tarot deck. Um, it's a, you know, it works as a tarot deck. There are suits. There are four suits. There's the major arcana and the minor arcana. You could use it as a tarot deck and use it to, you know, read your fortune. Um, or you could use it as a tarot deck to tell you what the whiskey you're about to taste will taste like. Um, but these are, they're sort of more oblique or um, obscure references. Or not obscure, esoteric. Uh, so things like as mortal as the belly of the ocean. You know, what does that taste like if someone t tells you have this whiskey, it tastes as mortal as the belly of the ocean. Each of these is for a different whiskey. Um, I don't reveal which whiskey is which because I think it's much more fun and entertaining for people to try to guess or to kind of puzzle it out or to, to think about it as, a th you know, these tastes that could be mixed and matched and applied to anything. Um, so this is a tarot deck. I also uh, rendered the major arcana as copper and charcoal and paper. Um, because those are uh, those are materials that are used in um, uh, whiskey craft. Uh, the following year, um, I'm going to start this playing back, and I'm going to see if this works to be able to freeze it. I found a technique for how to freeze this thing. Okay, great. Yeah, it's playing back. Um, so the following year I went to Iceland and, or wait, wasn't the following year? No, the following year I had the show, I had already been to Iceland. And I went to Iceland for a residency uh, determined not to make landscape photography. I was like, everyone who goes to Iceland makes landscape photography. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go and I'm not gonna make landscape photography. What did I do? I made fucking landscape photography. Um, but in my defense, uh, I like to think that it's a, a sort of sideways glance at landscape photography. Um, so the installation at Gallery 44 that you saw there in that footage um, includes these prints, uh, which look like the sort of epic, vast landscapes of Iceland, but they're actually macro shots of 
the asphalt in Reykjavik. So they're like lines of traffic paint on the asphalt on the street in Reykjavik. So what you're looking at here is about, I don't know, probably like, in reality is probably about an inch wide, but the print is very large. So this is kind of destabilization of scale. Um, this series was called Northern Epic. Uh, in the space, which, uh, by the way, I, um, I documented the show with a drone by flying a drone through the space because I figured that was the most Iceland landscape photography thing I could possibly imagine to do. Um, this was a 3D, like a stereoscopic photograph of clouds. And the main reason I went was to uh, make this video work. So this is called What Time Is It on the Sun? And this is a 24, exactly 24 hour long video that I shot during summer solstice in Iceland. And I set a camera up on the roof of the uh, former Coast Guard building at the edge of Reykjavik, like overlooking the water. And, oh, I should have paused there, sorry. Um, and so I just shot for 24 hours what the sky looked like during the summer solstice. And then when played back, I sync that to local time. So when you're looking at 1 p.m. At, in Iceland, it's 1 p.m. local time. When it's 3.07 a.m. local time, you're seeing the sky at 3.07 a.m. Um, in Iceland during the solstice. And becomes this like vague, abstract, almost like a, a, a time-based Rothko, if you like. Uh, the only time there's like recognizable imagery that enters the frame is right at midnight when the sun passes in front of the camera. It sort of like dips down towards the horizon and then lifts back up. Um, I had silent metronomes in the space. I had hacked them so they tick, but they don't make a tick sound. They just sort of like mark time, but if they don't tick, are they actually marking anything? Um, or do they kind of sit in a more geological time without the click, click, click? Uh, I do want to hold on this just for a second till we get to the, the video that you can hear in the background. Because I think this ties in a little bit um, with the show with the Judith, Norman, Alex. And this was a photograph of stones uh, lit by the skylight in the studio in Reykjavik. And um, so I printed it out and then set a light box at the same, roughly the same location uh, so that it would, so the light coming from it would hit the paper at the same angle. Uh, and it did this weird like uncanny sort of holographic effect on the stones. So if you're looking at them even from across the room, intellectually you know they're flat, but they kind of pop up slightly. These sort of side outcropping frames were um, uh, Reykjavik newspapers from around the time of the Second World War. So during the Second World War and sort of booking, bookending it before and after. Uh, and I had, I matted them down so that all you saw was the cover image of the newspaper. So at a time when the rest of the world was sort of in war and turmoil, um, Iceland, which was neutral, uh, went very inward landscape looking. And that was what was on the cover of its newspaper, a lot of landscapes. Sorry, I should give you an epilepsy warning here. Um, this flashes quite, quite quickly. Uh, I'm gonna let it play through for a second and then I'll tell you about it. Um, so I call that work Untitled, The Deluge, and 
Um, it's, it grows from taking photographs of a waterfall in Iceland. It's a very famous uh, sort of tourist destination waterfall near Vik. And uh, realizing that, oh, well, my photographs look the same as everyone else's on the internet. Like, I've done the same thing that I was talking about in that previous body of work, where I had this idea in my head of what an Icelandic waterfall looks like, and then I photographed it and made the, I replicated the thing that was my idea of it to begin with. Um, and so when I returned home, I started to think about, like, kind of, I suppose, my resistance to that and wanting to get to the bottom of sort of what that communal desire was about um, to image this thing in roughly the same way. So I built a little uh, software bot that combed Google image search for the top 1,000 hits of images that featured that waterfall and then repositioned them in the timeline. So each one takes the length of one frame in a video timeline, but it's sort of resized and maneuvered around the frame so that the waterfall stays you know, static, if you like, and all the extraneous image information just sort of like washes uh, around it rapidly in a kind of, in a torrent of images, if you like. So I'm going to jump ahead. Uh, that brings us to the work that's at the Judith and Norman Alex Art Gallery right now. Um, this is an abridged sonic history of global conflict uh, from last year. Um, I first showed it at Zaluki Contemporary in Toronto, and it's now at the JNAG. Um, I want to thank Make Lab also, who uh, was very supportive in helping me with the embroidery side of things and lending, a, lending me a giant machine that is a beautiful object uh, in addition to being very useful. So uh, this was work that I had been thinking about for years and a lot of, I don't know, I find I'm, I by no means think this is unique or even unusual, it's probably incredibly common, that artists like start thinking about a thing and have no idea what they're going to do with or about that. Um, for years, maybe. And there was a fight years and years ago about the Calgary band that was then calling themselves Viet Cong. And it was like an online sort of Twitter um, discussion slash argument slash fight over whether they should change their name. And so there were people saying, you know, our grandmothers still remember being tormented by the Viet Cong. It's horrible and insensitive for you to name your band, which is ostensibly for like, you know, a fun night out uh, listening to music and some entertainment um, and naming that after something horrible. But absent from that discourse was the fact that like, th this is not a new strategy that Viet Cong just came up with. This is like their their choice to do that, and they did eventually change their name. I think it was wise that they changed their name. I think it's the right call that they changed their name because they didn't have any particular reason for choosing Viet Cong. It wasn't a very good reason that they chose it, so it could have been anything. Um, and when it feels arbitrary like that, I'm not sure that there's, you know, necessarily a, a much of a justification to cling to it. But absent from that conversation was the fact that okay, well, but what about all the other bands that are named after atrocities or that are named after wars or battles or famous uh, generals or war criminals? Um, what about, uh, you know, Napalm Death or uh, Joy Division or Spandau Ballet or any of these other ones that have, that have actually really dark, violent... Um, political, military origins to their band name and reference points that somehow we haven't acknowledged or dealt with or talked about simply because maybe they're too old. Maybe the band is pre-internet and therefore, you know, nobody was just Googling Joy Division when Joy Division was releasing music in the late 70s because um, they couldn't. So people didn't know. It was like really insider information to know what that referred to. Um, and it sounds nice. It sounds like a nice thing. It's not a nice thing. So I started to just make a list. And like, when I first heard about that story, I came up with you know 10 or 20 off the top of my head and then wrote them down and just kind of kept going and kept researching it. 
so then it grew to be over 100, and I thought, I have to do something with these names. Um, and I toyed around with different material expressions of these different ways of kind of collecting them as an archive. Um, and it took, I feel, longer than it should have for me to arrive at patches, at embroidered patches, because those are these symbols that sit um, within music subcultures and military cultures. They are ways of denoting rank in military or belonging in the military. They're ways of denoting belonging or sometimes even rank in musical subcultures. Like, oh, you have that Metallica patch. Then you're, like, you're a super fan if you have that Metallica patch. You're, you're not a poser. You're hardcore. So there's this kind of like one-upping. There's a, a sort of veiled machismo, um, or maybe not so veiled machismo, to both of those cultures. And the, you know, the bodies that we send to war you know, mostly young, mostly male, are also the bodies that we put on stage in rock shows. Mostly young, mostly male. So it seemed like drawing it back to bodily adornment was kind of the right way of fusing those two together. Um, so this manifests, as you know, um, as an installation. Um, some of the uh, some of the patches are put onto jackets and sort of hung in this kind of Maybe a barracks closet, but also probably more like a thrift store, like a basement, uh, you know, thrift store with, you know, mod jackets and parkas and jeans and army surplus. Uh, some of them are arranged in frames, as on the left, in a bit of a nod to maybe um, legion halls or the ways that military or ephemera are displayed in places like that. And some of them are banners, these sort of vertical banners uh, that become um, somewhere between like standards, like when you march into battle with one of those vertical banners, or maybe like a like a you know a cot in a mobile army hospital or something like that. Uh, returning it back to the 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 soldier's body. Um, thanks. I saw that Laura Moore is here. Also, thanks, Laura, for your help installing the show. Um, I, had a, I had an assistant that time. Uh, and then, yeah, and I set up a kind of in situ corner of the installation that was a little bit like maybe going for a little bit of a basement, like a shitty basement gig kind of um, atmosphere with the particle board stage and uh, you know, a strategically placed piece of gaff tape on the stage. And a backpack, which often, of course, used in the military, also um, also a, a site for patch adornment in civilian musical subculture. Uh, the the cots slash standards are arranged according to conflict, and it was it felt important to me to regroup these patches based on the conflict that they're referring to. Um, if if I group them according to musical taste, then they're kind of just fam merch, right? They're just like merch for fans who like really like these three punk bands, and so that's why they're together, as opposed to drawing them back to their origins, uh, or back to the origin of the name, anyway. Also, I designed all the patches myself, and I and embroidered them, and I based them. I based the designs on the th the military thing it was referring to, and. Um, and a bit of research into the kind of visual culture of that conflict, um, as opposed to basing it on the style of music or basing it on like the band's wishes for their own band name and what it represents. Because I, want, um, I wanted it to not be a thing that you could fully separate from its military origins. Because that's, I mean, that's why it was chosen. And there are also these kind of like two competing tendencies overall of why bands choose um, a militarized name. There seem, I mean, there are a bunch of individual reasons, but in general, it's sort of they pick it for the like the bombastic machismo, or they pick it for um, either political solidarity or political satire. And I found the former was mostly metal bands. They're mostly picking these names for shock value, and punk bands are mostly picking these names for um, wanting to identify with, say, communism or socialism, or wanting to 
um, kind of sarcastically refer to the power structures that they're in the process of trying to rebel against. So we can return, since that's the, the sort of the work that's on at the gallery right now, we can return to that one. I do just want to mention a couple things that I'm working on at the moment. Um, so this has occupied my, a big chunk of my brain and life for the last few years. This is called Untitled Peter Tripp Project, and it's a collaboration that I'm doing with um, Regina-based artists, Johanna Bunton and Jaden Pfeiffer. And we've been working on this since about 2018-ish. Um, it was initiated by Jaden, and he had this preoccupation, again, for years before he necessarily knew what to do with it, with Peter Tripp, who was a, um, a, like a you know, pop rock DJ in New York in the 1950s. And in 1959, Tripp did a publicity stunt in the middle of Times Square where he broadcast without sleeping from this glass booth in Times Square for 201 hours. So that's about eight and a half days, no sleep, continually broadcasting. And broadcasting also in those days was like, it wasn't like you would play four songs in a row and then come on and do a, a quick sting. It was, you play one song and then you go back and you talk on the air again. And then you play one more song and then you're back on the air. And then you're reading the ad. You're like reading the two minute, 30 second ad spot or you're, um, throwing to the guy who does the weather for two minutes and then you're back. So it's this continual kind of, like there would have been no gap for him in there longer than a couple minutes long. And the pop songs of the late 50s are all like basically two and a half minutes anyway. So he started to hallucinate as he's, you know, going through the sleep deprivation experiment. He's, uh, he starts imagining that the console is on fire. He imagines at one point that he's that he's got like a doppelganger double. He imagines at another point that he is already the double who has replaced himself. Um, at one point he runs out of the booth into the snow in the middle of New York in January and gets physically dragged by his handlers back into the booth so he can complete the publicity stunt slash fundraiser. And so all of this brought up a lot of themes for us of exhaustion, of course, obviously, like the sort of the bodily limits of trying to continually do your work or do your thing. Um, and also of altered states or of maybe perception or consciousness. Uh, I think for Johanna and Jaden, who had just had a baby, the sleeplessness, the sleeplessness thing was kind of very resonant for them. I'm often up until five in the morning, so you know that feels resonant for me in a, maybe a different way because I just sort of naturally keep those hours. Um, but I was also really interested in the disembodiment that takes place within that um, FM broadcaster dynamic, where the broadcaster is throwing their voice out into the ether, but there's no difference to the 1959 radio DJ in the moment whether a million people are hearing them or zero people are hearing them. They have no way of knowing. They don't know how many people are tuned in. And I feel like radio is kind of the last medium where that's the case. Like television has the ratings box that knows where you've tuned to. The, um, you know, obviously anything on the internet, anything digital has like light counters and view counts and clicks and all that sort of stuff, right? So all of that stuff gets cataloged. You know whether a million people have seen your thing or depressingly only two, right? But in radio, you had to kind of continually perform as though lots of people were listening, even though you might have literally been talking just to yourself. Similarly, for the listener, the DJ is absent. The DJ is an absent body. We turn the radio on and we get their voice in our home. And so there's this kind of feeling of proximity. Um, but we don't know them. We don't, you know, we hear from them every day, but we've never met them. Um, so there's this kind of, I don't know, I guess a push-pull there too that resonates with other ways that I've explored mortality in my work. Um, you could say it's all about absent bodies, I suppose, if you wanted. Um, I'm gonna play a little bit of this piece. Um, this is a fragment. We've been basically making these performance fragments for a few years. Um, so this is one that we presented at Magnetic North in Vancouver a couple years ago at the Kulch. Thank you. 
Music. Curtain. Music. Opening. Sound. File being opened. Music. Curtain. Music. Opening. Sound. Unwilling feet. Sound. Great being called. Sound. Click. Projector starts up. Sound. Alarm clock goes off. Sound. Footsteps go off. Door opens and closes. Music. Curtain. Sound. Automobile horns. Cars whizzing by in background. Sound. Footsteps going off. Music. Opening. Sound. Light snoring. Sound. Snoring in staccato bursts as John wakes up. Music. Curtain. Music. Jazz music. Blues tempo established then hold in background. Sound. Breaking glass. Melting doors. Music. Curtain. Sound. Car engine in background. Sound. Speeding auto. Established. Skid comes up. Covers sound on motor. Music. A few chords on hum. Sound. Morse code. Sound. Distant lions roar. Sound. Closer. Lions roar. Sound. Lions roar just outside bedroom window. <laughs> Music. Curtain. Sound. Off mic. Door opens and closes. Music. Transition. Music. Transition. Sound. A quiet wind. Blowing steadily and sandy. Sound. Footsteps. Sound. Cover door opens. So, I'll just cut that there. Um, it's about eight minutes long. Um, and the the words that you're hearing spoken by the computer are um, every sound cue from a 1959 radio director's manual that we found at the library in the University of Regina. So it's um, it's it comes within these like longer sketches and radio plays, and it's just the foley tags. So we pulled all of the dialogue out and just kept um, those descriptions of the sounds. Um, then we were supposed to do this as a uh, live performance slash installation last summer, but as you may recall, things weren't really happening in person last summer. So uh, we switched to a series of online broadcasts. So uh, every night for eight days, so to kind of echo trips, eight days of uh, being awake, uh, every night we would do a Zoom performance. And it was a different performance each night. So we'd sort of have like more or less 24 hours to just kind of scramble and come up with something to come up with about 30 or 40 minutes of performance uh, that we could execute over Zoom. Um, so I'm going to play a little excerpt from that. This is called uh, Monologue for Connection. And this was, I was sort of thinking about what it meant to switch to, to Zoom, and I was coming up against my own frustrations of working with the digital as a medium, which in some ways, I mean, we think about it as um, more futuristic and advanced than analog media, but in some ways it's the reverse. In some ways it's more um, it's more sort of like start-stop. Um, it's more, I don't know, somehow more primitive or more like, you know, banging a rock against another rock than it is like a continuous waveform of information. So here's a little excerpt from that. Score for teleprompter. Score for teleprompter. I long for a medium. I long for a medium. Where I don't know how many people are listening. Where I don't know how many people are listening. And where I could have a million pairs of eyes on me. Or exactly zero. Or exactly zero. And never know the difference. And never know the difference. I want my medium to be simultaneously unpredictable. Simultaneously unpredictable. And reliable. And reliable. It would always show you something. It would always show you something. While never being capable. While never being capable. Of showing you everything. 
I long for a medium that relies on connection, on physical connection, on gold-plated, 18-gauge, 75-ohm, 100-foot, line of electrons smashing against each other like some kind of quantum orgy kind of connection. I long for a medium that is linear. It tells me what is coming up, what happened last week, which one is programmed next, what's after the break. I do not want it to fast forward or rewind, to pause or load, to jump, to uplink, to stream, to download. So it's a little excerpt from that. It gives you a sense of it. Oh, sorry, I was muted there. Um, that's another excerpt from uh, that project. It gives you a bit of a sense of it. Um, and a bit of a sense of like what we were thinking about vis-a-vis -vis putting something online that we had always kind of intended to be live. Um, so for that fragment, I set my webcam up towards an old analog CRT monitor, black and white monitor. And then I had two analog cameras feeding into that monitor by means of just like physically replugging, un unplugging and replugging the two cables to change camera angles. So it was a kind of re-physicalization of the switcher, um, of the camera switcher. But then like rendered as, you know, data and bits and sent over Zoom. It, I don't know, it felt, it felt weird to be like spending all of this time and energy, but of course like it felt necessary to be spending all of this time and energy to make that weirdly disembodied Zoom experience as kind of physical and like tangibly connected as possible. Uh, I'm going to skip this one because I'm, I'm just aware of the time. Uh, and then I want to show one last thing before I kind of open it up to, uh, to more questions. Uh, this is a project I'm currently working on. And I'm calling this, We Each of Us Herald Our Own Obsolescence. This is a, these are images of the Telstar, which was a telecommunications satellite. And of course, obviously, because of the Peter Tripp project, I've been thinking about telecommunications a lot. And I'm kind of obsessed with this object. Like, it's such a beautiful, weirdly retro-futurist object. Um, it was the first, it carried the first transatlantic um, phone communications that weren't terrestrial. Uh, it broadcast the first transatlantic TV signals, live TV signals. Um, and it was like it was so kind of known at the time, this AT&T satellite that um, like a British rock band called the Tornadoes made a song about it. They made this like instrumental song about it that I'm sure you would recognize if you heard. And I was interested in it because it's still up there. Like it still is in orbit floating around. It's not used. It's just space debris now. But it's still there. It's still like in orbit of the planet. And I stumbled on this weird thing where around the time that it was made or that it was launched, all of these different postal services all over the world commemorated it. So there are stamps from St. Pierre and Miquelon. There are stamps from uh, the Bahamas. There are stamps from um, Sri Lanka. There are stamps from uh, you know, Indonesia, stamps from Saudi Arabia. And they're all commemorating the launch of this telecommunications platform, which is the thing that will eventually replace the post office. I mean, in terms of letter mail, right? In terms of sending postcards and letter mail. Um, that like ability to send images and signals through outer space uh, heralds their own obsolescence. So there's this kind of like huzzah moment of all of these kind of uh, postal services like celebrating this new platform, you know, aware or unaware at, at what it's eventually going to mean for them. Uh, so then I've been, I've been collecting these things and these stamps and placing them into um, sort of celestial body arrangements. Um, these are, I put the stamps on a, a board and then 
there are these like laser cut perforations in a solid piece of MDF that goes in front of them. So they're this kind of like uh, like stars or planets, if you like. Um, yeah, I don't really know what else to say about those. These are this is work in progress. I'm just kind of like playing around with it still and, and making these compositions, um, but thinking about still about that idea of you know, communication at a distance. It feels very, I mean, you know, you could argue that the Telstar looks a little bit like a COVID spore, but um, I'm thinking about communication at a distance, disembodiment, and how we sort of send signals out about who we are or what we want to communicate um, that are meant to extend past our, you know, physical location or past our physical limitations as in a lifespan. Um, so I think with that, uh, I'd like to um, end the that formal formal ish part and switch back to conversation. Um, let me figure out how to stop my screen share. That should have done it, I hope. Okay. Yes. Great. Excellent. Uh, so I want to just welcome anyone. If you have questions at the bottom of your screen, you'll find a Q&A function with a little speech bubble above it. If you click that, it will open a screen and you can type any questions you have in there or you can also use the chat room. I see that we do have one comment here. Uh, did you consider embroidering the Telesat uh, commemorative stamps? <laughs> That's a really nice idea. I didn't. Um, they would probably be totally gorgeous. Um, I feel like that's one of those times, though, where I maybe have to choose between uh, conceptual consistency and making objects of uh, just sheer pleasure. Um, to me, it's important that the stamps are the original stamps, because that's kind of the moment of commemoration. Um, and it's, and it's about those as physical objects, those records of the commemoration, those records of like, I mean, it's interesting also because the stamps were ultimately unused, right? Because the ones that are available to me now that I can buy from collectors are ones that didn't get sent through the post for the most part. I mean, I have a couple that were like, that came on postcards because they were also commemorative postcards. Um, but yeah, for the most part, they're ones that were never used. Um, that I get still in their like collector's sheets or whatever. So I don't know, to me there's something a little bit more kind of intellectually important about retaining that link, that historical link. Um, but they would be absolutely lovely as embroideries. Yeah, so I probably should think about that a little bit more. Um, I love how you've given them this uh, kind of new importance by placing them in this constellation format, ex especially because so many people seem to be turning to more like esoteric uh, ways of thinking, especially when um, stresses like what is going on right now uh, kind of rear their heads again. So I think that's interesting to place them in that context the way you frame them. Thanks. So, a quick look at the chat. Laura Moore sent a, a happy face so during the comment of install. We have a pretty quiet group here. Uh, I do want to say, since we have a little lull, if anybody's looking for that Q&A box to pull it up, but um, while you type, I do want to mention that Lee's returning on August 5th at 7 o'clock for a DJ set, which is inspired by the bands that are in the current exhibition. So you can expect uh, punk and glam rock, as you have called it. Uh, and it's kind of an exploration. I hope you don't mind me saying this, Lee. Like, yeah, go for it. If, if the exhibition had a soundtrack, what would that soundtrack sound like? <laughs> We're going to explore that a little bit. So I do encourage you to go on the gallery website jnag.ca and register for that um, it will be hosted through zoom as well in a similar format to what this evening looks like i mean it is oh, the we... the most common question that i got in relationship to the show was why isn't there a soundtrack um and i get it like i get i i get the desire people have for that um i think it's like 
I think that desire is probably two-pronged and that one of those prongs is the same desire that my students have when they can't resist putting a soundtrack on a video because like there's a kind of horror vacui of having silent video or silent media um, we're used to mm -hmm. and you know I do this too I talk really really fast when I'm giving artist talks so I like to fill that space with stuff because it's more comfortable to fill the space with stuff but you know also it's important to have uh, those quiet kind of contemplative haunting experiences um, and also I just think like you know bring your phone when we're back in physical space bring your phone bring some headphones and you know Google or YouTube the the band and find out what it sounds like if you want to find out what it sounds like um, but I think it would if I had like a broadcast soundtrack all the time through the show it would sort of like I don't know, it would do something different. It would make it less contemplative a space. We have another comment here. Uh, someone is saying, great presentation. Wondering if your grandmother got to see the Golden Girls art installation. She did not. She died before it, um, before it appeared. She, I should say, she also spent, I mean, I, I often, I remember her saying things like, well, you know, I'll I'll be I'll be gone soon. This will be this will be my last Christmas. I'll be gone soon, or things like that. It was like, which could be read as maudlin. I think it was just sort of generally matter of fact. Um, but she also like I don't know. She said that for like thirty years, so she always had a a, a pretty reasonable uh, <laughs> a a pretty song forward approach to her own mortality. So but my no, grandmother she used to. to my grandmother used to bring a different dress out every time I'd visit and say, this is the one for the casket, just to, <laughs> and then the I'm next either. visit, it might be a different one. It's a mental note, okay, right. <laughs> how serious do I need to take the comment? Yeah, that's great. Um, there's a question here about the um, Icelandic landscape. So although you choose not to photograph the Icelandic landscape, were you influenced by the unique colors? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I don't know that there's a way not to be. Uh, it's, I think that, that's a really nice point actually because I, I think it's the thing that I noticed the most was the difference in color of light because it's kind of perpetual magic hour. Like it's, this is going to be controversial. The landscape isn't that thrilling to people from Canada. It's like Canada but smaller. So it's like, Oh, here's a glacier and here's a mountain. Yeah, well, we have those two. They're just bigger and further apart. You have to drive for three days to get from one to the other instead of 20 minutes. But, you know, we have those two. We've, we're familiar with them. Maybe the volcanoes are a little bit different. But, um, yeah, so it's not, it's not that alien. What's alien is that it's all so compressed. Like, it looks like a miniature model of all the varieties of landscape and that's really weird but yeah it's it's the light it's all about the. Light. i mean obviously it would be completely different if i went at a different time of year especially if i went in the winter where there isn't any light um, or very little um but yeah i for sure was influenced by the colors um and that's why i mean there's that that video what time is it on the sun is just color field like it's there really isn't image information there it's just a wash of color that slowly shifts over 24 hours we have a comment that says love your work as always the current show is interesting thoughtful and fun uh, i so want to see the telstar work oh that's bruce so everybody's that's... looking for it. yeah great i don't know if did he did he jump out i'll get in touch yeah. with him about the to show him those Okay, I think that wraps the evening for us, Lee. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. This Thanks is wonderful. For me. That was a blast. I'm really looking forward to opening the doors to the public. Uh, can't wait to get people up in the space, and uh, can't wait to listen to some good music <laughs> in the coming weeks. Why didn't you say it'd be good music? <laughs> well, I'm sure there will be happy. We'll there will be good, there will be good stuff. There will be good stuff. You, I don't know if you like. I don't know if you'll like Napalm Death. We'll see. We'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for taking the time to be with us this evening. And uh, hopefully we see you again soon. Bye. Thanks, Sonia. <laughs>